Next Curve. Hey everyone, welcome to Next Curve's Rethink webcast and our series on the radio to the Rick. Cool title, right? What do you think, Patrick? Awesome. <laughs> Always rocking yeah. the title. Yes, so today I am joined by a long time uh, friend and thought leader and voice in the telecoms industry, Patrick Lopez, who is currently the founder and CEO of Core Analysis, and a, um, which is a boutique analyst and consulting firm that helps companies make sound telecom and cloud decisions. So uh, welcome, Patrick. Yeah, glad to have you. And it's good to finally have you on. And uh, why don't you take a moment, not that not that the whole world doesn't already know you, but take a moment to introduce yourself and your firm. That's, that's very kind, Leonard. Thanks for having me. Uh, no, hopefully the whole world does not know me. Uh, and uh, I don't think that I've uh, garnered that much uh, interest. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, introducing myself and my company is always uh, helpful. Um, I, as you mentioned, I run a, a small uh, analyst and consulting firm uh, called Core Analysis, and um, I'm specializing at the intersection of telecom and cloud networks. Mm -hmm. um, what's uh, a little different uh, is that although I created that firm uh, close to 12 years ago, um, some of my consulting uh, work end up sometimes being uh, leading to more long-term uh, relationships. So for instance, uh, uh, I was global VP of uh, networks innovation for the Telefonica group, uh, mm -hmm. where my family yep. and I moved to Spain, uh, to Madrid for a few years. Nice. Um, then I came back to uh, Toronto, where mm -hmm. I am based. And um, I became also a global VP of product management for NEC, yep. uh, looking after all their telecom products. Um, so. Um, I think I offer kind of a different perspective in the sense that um, I am an analyst. Uh, I've been yeah. a network operator. Uh, yeah. I've been a telecom vendor. Mm -hmm. uh, I've uh, deployed, uh, integrated um, a number of technologies, Open RAN being one of them, uh, yep. Edge Computing, another one. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to Open RAN, I was like very fortunate to actually uh, been part of the teams that deployed the first technologies before it was even called open run before there was an open run alliance before there was tips so uh it's very exciting to see how much progress we've made uh in those last few years that is pretty amazing and you know you have a pretty amazing background i think those everything that you've just outlined really uh differentiate differentiates you in uh, what is a pretty large uh community of analysts and i I personally appreciate a lot of the uh, perspectives that you bring to the table. And I've always enjoyed having briefings with you when you were with vendors, you know, and we've always had interesting conversations. So I, I really appreciate you uh, being on uh, this podcast uh, with me. And, uh, you know, Patrick, what I really I wanted to talk about is um, not surprisingly open ran, right? Oh. You and I, we've talked about it several times, you know, over the course of the last few years. And um, I, I really want to focus on some of the things that you've been posting as well as publishing it in your research. Okay, so this should okay. be pretty familiar, not too out of left field, other than, than you know maybe some of the stuff that I might uh, uh, throw at you as we're uh, as you're describing and going over some of the key points of your research. But um, you know, okay, uh, what I wanted to start off with is the state of Open RAN. I mean, we've been on this journey for uh, um, quite some time. It's been yeah. very, very dramatic to say the least, right? I mean, you would call it a bit dramatic, don't you think? <laughs> I, uh, I don't know. Like, it's been fun, and there's been lots of lots of yeah. um, movements. So that I mean, that's great. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, no doubt, no doubt. But uh, you know, a couple of months ago, you published um, a market report. Uh, entitled um, Open RAN RIC and Apps for 2023. And in the LinkedIn post that um, you made that uh, kind of announced the report, you made a statement, an interesting statement. Open RAN is 
going through a torturous journey. And uh, I just wanted to ask you, what did you mean by that? And how does that relate to your thoughts on the state of Open RAN today? Okay, uh, I'll try to be uh, as short as I can be. Um, no, you don't need to be. <laughs> but okay, I, I tend to I tend to uh, ramble on, so cut no, me. It's okay. <laughs> That's what we're here for, um, right? To listen to you ramble. <laughs> so listen. Yeah. Um, Open RAN. So as I mentioned, um, when I was at Telefonica, uh, mm -hmm. I had uh, uh, one of the teams that I was supporting uh, had an extraordinary. Um, mandate they were trying to connect the un unconnected in latin america yeah uh mm. there's over like 100 million people in latin america that are unconnected right. and basically um these were people that you you didn't know how to connect uh because um yeah. well you're not going to uh, put fiber in the middle of the jungle that doesn't work yeah um uh, uh low altitude and, and flying networks uh, or high altitude platforms were just in their infancy at the time and, right. uh, and difficult. Yeah. Um, and basically the best way to connect them was wireless, was uh, basically cellular. Mm -hmm. But again, um, you know, deploying uh, networks uh, in the deserts, the jungles uh, of the Amazon, uh, it's... Uh, it's well it's difficult oh yeah uh, it's costly yeah. um and, and then the team also found out uh that basically the networks the way they were designed and architected was not really good for this type of environment mm -hmm. um not only from a physical standpoint but uh, yeah. uh logically i mean we've been developing mobile networks for mostly urban areas uh, high yeah, density right, urban areas, right. right? That's true. And and deploying mobile networks for low density, vast areas yeah. uh, was difficult and very expensive with the technology yeah. we have today. And so one of the ideas was okay, well, you know, there are a number of components in a in a telecom network, in a radio network that yeah. can be broken down, mm -hmm. and you don't need to have all of those components like in every antenna on every mast uh, because yeah. that's what is costly. Uh, yeah. So you can simplify and take some of the intelligence out of that and kind of centralize it so that yeah. you only get the bare minimum. Right. Um, and that was the beginning of basically the RAN disaggregation, uh, right. which eventually led to Open RAN. Um, mm -hmm. And Open RAN originally was in not invented, but like intended <laughs> at least right. for, for those kind of scenarios. Right. Um, and obviously at the beginning, people were like, it's never going to work. You know, sure, uh, sure, it, sure. like technology is not going to support it and yeah. like don't even bother. Um, and it worked. It worked in rural environment. And then some mm -hmm. crazy people were like, okay, well, you know, maybe it can work for other environments as, as well, right, uh, right. like urban environments and right. started uh uh, to deploy it in other places, like in Tokyo, for instance, which right, is probably right. one of the most intensive uh, environment from a radio uh, propagation and a spectrum management perspective, with lots of interference, right. lots of buildings, yeah. etc. And they made it work, you know. And 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 then people were like, oh well, you know, yeah, but it doesn't work as well. It's not as performing. And then you know. When people like Docomo and Rakuten deployed it in Tokyo and ended up having performance mm. that are very similar to what we see mm. in other uh, mature networks. Like, okay, well, it works, but it, it's not as secure, you know? Yeah. As And then there was quite a lot of studies that demonstrated that basically, I mean, Open RAN is as secure as traditional RAN. Mm -hmm. uh, the only difference is, well, if you disaggregate and you have open interfaces, well, the more interface, the more attack surface. But really, yeah. it's more a product of being cloud-run and disaggregated than the product of being open-run. And, you know, there's yeah, no right. special distinction there. Right. Um, mm. And so, I mean, there's been a lot of, you know, ebb and flow in open-run in uh -huh. the sense that uh, there's yeah. been a lot of interest uh, and very basically ambitious promises that were made. Uh, and then there's been like a continuous 
type of deployments that sure. have demonstrated some uh, capabilities, but it hasn't fulfilled yet all its promises. So that's what I meant right. by saying that it was a torture. It's been a torturous journey and yeah. continues to be. Uh, we've seen some big news just last week with uh, uh, with Tarek. Uh, yeah, and Mobile, we'll, for instance. We'll get that. Rakuten. We'll get to that in a moment. We'll get to that in a moment. All right, I definitely. I'll let you drive. <laughs> yeah, but uh, no, you're bringing up some. But number one, you're providing a wonderful background on the on the originate, you know, the origin story for uh, Open RAN, and I, you know, I I think the whole architectural shift that's going toward more cloud native architectures is is a bit independent of it, but it is interesting you know the open aspect right because i always yeah. look at it as look there's cloud native transformation happening or enablement of uh of um architectures and then there's the choice of mm -hmm. being open or closed right and so i think that's in, in depending on how you look at it we've either made some pretty good progress or we haven't and i think the folks who are going to say that we haven't made a lot of progress are the ones who have set the expectations that everything should be completely open, all the interface should be completely open. But when in fact, we've actually architecturally have made a lot of changes that could in the future, uh, foster a lot of the interoperability that everyone's looking for. Um, because in a lot of ways, I mean, I'd like to get your take on this, uh, the, in particular, the ORAN Alliance, I mean, you know, there's still, it's still a work in progress. And one of the things you mentioned, Tarek, one of the things that Tarek used to always tell me is like, uh, you know, we're kind of building the plane while it's in flight. And I think that's so true, especially as it comes to the interfaces, because the definitions and standardization of that uh, has taken time. Um, and maybe expectations have been ahead of where standards as well as the technology, technological transformation uh, have actually been able to pr um, progress, right? And I think that, uh, you know, um, that that's at least my view. And uh, I totally appreciate how uh, you've characterized <laughs> the torturous journey. But I think, it, I really think it, it depends on how you look at it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think I think you're right. Uh, I mean, it's a matter of perspective. Um, yeah. And I think if we zoom out as well, you know, Open RAN has been around for like what six, seven years, and uh, like in six, seven years, we went from like ideas and concepts and PowerPoint to networks being deployed commercially at scale. Um, right. And and I don't know any other technology that has gone that fast in telecoms. You know, I remember all my mm. MS and it took like 15 years for MS to be, to be at maturity. Um, right. I remember, uh, you know, push to talk. Uh, I remember mm. um, even closer to now, like the deployment of 5G standalone. I mm. mean, uh, the, the things take time in telecoms uh, and, and for good reasons. I mean, mm. networks uh, are, um, I would say networks and network operators are providing a service that is uh, uh, critical infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you, you can't rush things uh, and you can't deploy things right. that do not meet the SLA that yeah. you're going to, to meet. So that's one yeah. aspect of it. Um, I think another aspect of it as well is, I mean, there are different aspects and different things that impacted uh, the, the velocity of open run. Uh, right. But, uh, if you look at Oran Alliance, uh, it's it's interesting to note that you actually have a lot of people, a lot of traditional vendors that are in Oran Alliance, yeah, uh, and contributing <laughs> to Oran Alliance. Absolutely, um, yeah. uh, Their contribution are not always favoring uh, velocity. <laughs> uh, yeah. In the sense yeah. that, you know, if you're a traditional vendor of RAN, uh, or RAN, open RAN is interesting, but it, it might be a risk to part of your business. So you, sure. it might not be in your best interest for open RAN to develop and deploy as fast as possible. Right. Um, and, and then there's been other events, you know, open RAN was still in its infancy when Actostar was acquired by uh, uh, Rakuten, Rakuten Mobile. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and, I would I would think actually that kind of like slowed down the implementation of Open Run because it gave pause to everybody and 
a lot of network operators are not used to buy from other network operators. So that model hasn't been proven yet, you know. Yeah. Um, and Rakuten has been very successful, mostly in greenfield environment, uh, but brownfield environment and tier one operators, I, I think uh, it still remains to be seen whether they're ready to buy at scale from, it's not a competitor because it's a different geography. Yeah, but they, I mean, yeah. it's a different beast than uh, yeah. a telecom equipment manufacturer with whom you have, you've been working for the last 10 years or 20 years, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think the only thing that could have had more of a global, uh, let, let's call it global implications outside of the Jap Japanese market would have been maybe AST, right? Um, yeah. But other than that, yeah, I mean. Um, and I mean, there's been COVID, COVID in the middle as well, right? So yeah, I, I, yeah I, that I mean, didn't help. <laughs> that, the, so, I mean, there's been a bunch of things, but mm. taking all of that together, I think, I mean, Open Run has been progressing actually pretty well. Okay. All right. So uh, now, um, I, I let me ask you this question: at at, at at the highest level, what do you think that the movement has done right in the past to get us to where we are today? Yeah. And, and then, where do you think um, things have kind of gone sideways? Where you know maybe uh, there is an opportunity to course correct even today. So maybe. Yeah. You share your thoughts on those two things. Um, I think uh, what the ecosystem has done right is um, the relentless demonstration uh -huh. of yeah. how it works and what it does. Uh, right. You know, whether the Oran Alliance or TIP um, or uh, the different. Uh, labs that have been created yeah. um that has shown that i i mean it's shown the progress and the maturity right, right? i mean yeah. you have had a lot more and more companies contributing to plug fests yeah. and those plug fests have been successful by and large in yeah. demonstrating that a functionally it could work and then more and more features and then more and more performance right. and yeah. you know Obviously, I mean, there was a time where like the big challenge for Open Run was just like the very first step, the front hole interface. And yeah. now pretty much everybody accept that, yeah, it works. It works well. It meets the, yeah. the need. Now we move down to other uh, challenges, right? So uh, I, I think that worked well. Uh, and I think we've seen also a number of governments uh, that have endorsed Open Run as right. a technology Mm. For a variety of reasons, right? I mean, some yeah. of them are geopolitical, some of them yeah. are purely economical, uh, and some of them are, are uh, for basically governments that have an actual technology strategy that they want to follow or endorse. Sure. Uh, sure. Uh, so, I mean, there there's a variety of reasons. So all of that went very quite well, I think. Mm. Um, now, on the other side, what could have gone better uh, is, you know, and there are a couple of things. Um, introducing a new vendor uh -huh. in a telecom network uh -huh. is like, you know, it's $50 million. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's what it costs. It costs $50 million, three to four years. That's what it costs to the operator to yeah. bring in new gear, learning the new vendor, right. integrate that, making sure it works and deploying at scale. Mm. Um, and... Um, Open RAN proposed to do that with mm. multiple vendors, right? Mm. Uh, so the I think the accent wasn't made, put on integration early enough. Uh, yeah. If yeah. operators really wanted multi vendors, yeah, um, right. that was that was one 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 point. Um, another point uh, is more recent; is related to the RIC. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think so. Open RAN was created among other reasons to disrupt traditional uh, RAN yeah. and to disrupt traditional RAN vendors. Um, and I think non-real-time RIC and our apps uh, achieve that very well in the sense that yeah. it, you know, it's, uh, it's the evolution of uh, uh, EMS and OSS and SON mm -hmm. all put together for right. RAN intelligence um, and provides a relatively easy um, access uh, entry point 
for companies that are not necessarily RAN companies right, uh, right. or even telecom companies, right? Right, right? And we've seen a number of vendors that are coming from adjacent uh, fields yeah. get into uh, this field and getting quite successful. I mean, we're not mm -hmm. in commercial deployments yet, but it's getting traction and growing, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Now, near real time, Rick, um, you know, it's a different beast. I mean, they both named Rick, but they're completely different. Right. And, right. and the near real time, Rick, um, you know, disrupts not only traditional RAN vendor, but also open RAN vendors mm -hmm. um, in the sense that basically you extract uh, features from uh, the CU, DU, and RU and put them into uh, a platform um, mm -hmm. for basically multi vendors to get in. Uh, and I think that's going to see a lot of resistance for deployment yeah. at scale. Hmm. Uh, just because yeah. the Jewel Scrum for any run vendor uh, is the scheduler at mm -hmm. the end of the day. The scheduler yeah. is what makes your uh, radio work. Right. And that's what it makes it high performance. Mm -hmm. And I think letting third party mess with that is anathema for a lot of vendors. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then that's where you do all your differentiation in the, in the schedule, right. you know, like yeah. uh, uh, the massive MIMO, beam forming, beam yeah. steering capabilities, uh, the uh, carrier aggregation, the dynamic spectrum sharing, all those yeah. advanced features that make your product the best in the market. You, yeah. They're in there. Yeah. Or they have an impact in there. And I think that you will find a lot of companies that will resist <laughs> having other companies uh, putting apps on their uh, on their near real time rig. Right. Um, right. And and if they do, and some of these reasons are very legitimate, I think, beyond the commercial and strategic aspect. Yeah. It's just that it's a delicate machinery. <laughs> uh, yeah. You need yeah. to understand very well how it works, um, yeah. and. You know, nobody's really talking about conflict management between apps, uh, mm -hmm. but you know, but there's no free lunch out there. Uh, out there, you cannot have an app yeah. that does power efficiency yeah. and an app that does uh, quality of experience management or spectrum optimization, and mm -hmm. they're running at the same time, and they both achieve an optimum by yeah. magic, right? There's got to yeah. be some negotiation, yeah. some prioritization there, and, yeah. and that's not. That's not Perfect. yet something that people are thinking about either and or working on in the standard. So yeah. before it's commercial, it's even further away. So uh, yeah. I think that's kind of like the things that went well and things that still have a little bit of work to uh, uh, go further. Yeah, th you know, those are great insights. And um, yeah, you know, my, my whole view has been for quite some time, actually, when we were at MWC, Oh, geez, which one was it? I know it was in Las, it, may, it might have been Los Angeles, the last yep. Los Angeles one where we hung out and uh, we were talking about Telco Cloud and we had a good laugh about that. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, th that's when I started to formulate this whole, uh, uh, you, you know, thesis that, wait a minute, um, there's a little bit too much early focus on openness and um, not... Uh, enough on actually creating a stack solution, whether you're pursuing, uh, you know, pursuing open is fine, interoperability fine. But I think a lot of the, the, um, I, I guess the, what you would call the, uh, the uh, theories that really were the key ones that people were putting at the forefront of the value proposition of uh, open ran at the time those are i didn't think those were the right ones to go with i, I mean you still need, like you're saying you got to get out of greenfield you got to figure out brownfield and then the number one first step is always integration in what whatever form right because yeah. you're you're gonna if in a brownfield you're gonna be introducing your stuff into a heterogeneous mix of stuff and that has to number one integrate and i i didn't see a lot of vendors at the time really get that so that's how i when that the that um netflix show squid game came out that's yeah. say, 2022 and 20 especially this year is going to be the year of open around squid game and 
it, it ended up being kind of true. But uh, I, you know, I think a lot of what you've just shared with us has has kind of reinforced that that thinking and I and hopefully what the movement can do is uh, make that shift right because I still think there are too many labs too many trials not enough companies at this moment that can actually go into a brownfield environment as you're su you're suggesting and actually integrate and coexist with uh, what is a constantly evolving um, portfolio right and I think that's what a lot of CTO you know a lot of operator CTOs that I spoke with, I mean, that's kind of like how they were thinking, even though you have some skunk work groups working on open RAN, I, I didn't see a lot of occasion or many occasions or I didn't speak to many technology leaders within uh, the operator um, organization that were looking at doing like a big bang and just revamping and going every, you know, entirely uh, open ran. So yeah. uh, the readiness issues and all those things are uh, problematic. So I think, you know, you and I, uh, it's really not that much of a secret of kind of seeing eye to eye. Again, going back to why I appreciate uh, your perspectives and, um, uh, and um, why I'm glad that you're on this podcast. So, hey, you know, I want to move on to another topic, which is a more recent thing that you published. You touched on a couple of points uh, related to this, but I wanted to see, uh, give you an opportunity to maybe uh, provide some additional highlights or points uh, on this uh, piece that you've done, uh, you recently published on uh, RICs and apps and what developers need to succeed. And then, uh, uh, so you mentioned something like, you had this like Venn diagram, right? With three cells. Yeah. Um, one was uh, RAN knowledge, uh, the other was platform, and then the other was data literacy slash AI competency, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe, uh, you know, you can uh, share with the audience what you're thinking it, it was there, even though I think you might have touched on a few of those points uh, in our uh, prior Sure, chat. sure. Um, so I, I think a lot of people that are interested in RIC and apps uh, mm -hmm. are basically selling the concept of run intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, and part of it is observability, being able to have a better understanding of the state of your yeah. whole network, understanding cell by cell, carrier by carrier, the performance um, uh, and the health. Mm -hmm. um, and then another part is to actually use that information to optimize it uh, or even to automate uh, mm -hmm. basically settings across your network. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's one of the promises of, uh, of the RICs and the apps. And in order to do that, well, you have to have sufficient data literacy, right? You need to be able to collect uh, data points from various vendors uh, from various network elements um, and to be able to form a coherent picture yeah. and representation of basically the state uh, of yeah. the infrastructure. And that, you know, you'll have a lot of companies that have been doing that forever uh, in yeah. the cloud yeah. or in telecom. And now it happens that Rick offers a way to do that in, in the RAN as well. So that's, that's great. Yeah. Um, then, Pushing a little further, a lot of companies use that as a way to, you know, artificial intelligence is everyone's yeah. uh, favorite uh, uh, buzzword right buzzword now, you moment. know. Yeah. Uh, so between AI, machine learning, uh, yeah. large, langu uh, large language models, um, you're getting a lot of companies that are basically using all those terms as a shorthand to basically show that they can do pretty graph with uh, nice projection curves, but I mean, yeah. it's not really AI, ML, yeah, but yeah, yeah. nonetheless, nonetheless, but those companies that have strong capability in that field, mm -hmm. they're able not only to have a good understanding of what's going on in the network, but also to provide some level of prediction. Sure. Uh, and, and then if you have that, then you should know what you can do to optimize and what you can do to correct. Um, and in order to do that, what you need, though, is very good run knowledge. Right. Mm -hmm. For the same reason that you need to have very good knowledge of 
the scheduler, you know, that you have very capability to do like near real time interaction with the network, you need to have very good run knowledge in order to be able to apply the findings that you get through the data level layer uh, to optimize, to correct, to uh, troubleshoot your network, right? Um, And uh, that, you know, that combination of like in that vein diagram between data literacy and run knowledge, uh, well, that's where you you can find companies that could be successful in that field. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's a third element to it, which is, you know, a lot of companies or a lot of operators would like that ecosystem to be multi-vendor. Mm-hmm. They would like ideally to have those app providers being able to port those apps from one rig to another and being able to be on the near real-time rig and a non-real time rig from vendor A, from vendor B, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in order to do that, in order to do that well, uh, well, you need a platform. Uh, and you need to have the capability, uh, the experience of having basically a developer uh, ecosystem uh, management. Uh, so that comes with uh, uh, SDKs, training, uh, it comes with the uh, uh, data sets that can be used to educate uh, AI ML models. Uh, it comes also with uh, a variety of, uh, uh, you know, life cycle management capabilities, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So there are a lot of companies that can do that and have been doing yeah. that very, uh, very successfully, particularly on the cloud front, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so if we add that third element to that Venn diagram, I mean, yeah. uh, those companies that can do all three uh, yeah. are few and far in between, but they, they right. have the most chance in my mind to uh, be able to create the value that people are projecting for Rick and Apps. Yeah. And so for those of you who are wondering who those companies are, you have to go and read his report. So yeah, <laughs> and you can plug it later on. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, and I think, no, I, I think this is a great perspective because I, especially many of these uh, new vendors that are new entrants coming from the IT side, the cloud side, it has been kind of a rude awakening for them, right? Because mm-hmm. a lot of, uh, many of them didn't know about RAN. And as they started to move across the edge, you know, starting from telco cloud, um, more on the far, uh, you know, like the near edge, uh, closer to the far edge with the RAN, uh, they discovered, hey, wait a minute, this is a very different world, you know, and even down to at the silicon level, right, they were assuming uh, all these accelerators and um, architectures in the data center would translate well into a cabinet uh, out in the, uh, you know, uh, out at a uh, cell site and that just has not turned out to be the case right and so i think this is a great perspective because it's a good way for vendors to self-assess themselves right like how much do we know about ran what are we what kind of assumptions are we taking into uh the open ran and um uh, and are we setting ourselves up for success so i think it's brilliant that's it's really cool stuff there patrick Thanks, Leonard. Uh, well, yeah. I think you, you, you summarized it too well. It's, uh, I mean, we're we're looking at a continuum uh, yeah. between the cloud and basically the device in our in our hands, and mm-hmm. that continuum is formed of like different segments, um, and they all have attributes that are a little bit different. And you have specialist companies Absolutely. in each yeah. of those fields, but they haven't really collaborated it's yeah. been more co- competition uh, right now to uh, basically yeah. manage the connectivity but right. none of those companies can alone manage the connectivity end to end so uh, some level of collaboration is necessary and right. that takes some knowledge uh, of uh, the technology uh, that goes in each of those segments yeah know? but then also there's that whole angle of complexity that I introduced because you all have to, you have to integrate test certify everything right and to get it out into the field and that and that i think that's again one of one of the big challenges the, the nuts that still need to be cracked in my opinion and uh, i don't know how you feel about that but um also 
you know, I think on the telco side, there's still a lot of folks who don't really understand what cloud native is. I still hear a lot of people talk cloud native. I'm going, wow, no, the microservices, this is what microservices really are. You know, this is yeah. what containers are and how they evolved and why we're looking at, you know, what yeah. kind of benefit that they can bring to Iran architecture. And then, uh, you know, AI itself. I mean, come on, people, it's probabilistic. It's not deterministic. So let's not make the mistake of assigning AI critical functions. It, it, you know, what I found is um, a lot of companies that are using AI at the edge for more, let's say, uh, critical needs are finding that those applications tend to be very, very specific. Do you yeah. know what I'm saying? And to actually don't look that intelligent. They're cognitive or percep perceptive. They enhance perception, but they're not yeah. necessarily smart and intelligent. And I think those are the things that also still need to be reconciled. But I, I, I think you did a great job of highlighting where are, where are most of us truly in the state of that uh, AI maturity curve, right? It's like macros on an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> For, for most folks, you know, and well, that, that, that's where I'm at. That's where I am. I'm not a specialist. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a data scientist. I've I've worked with teams that have yeah. data scientists and researchers yeah. in that field. Yeah, I don't understand everything they they yeah. do. Yeah. I do understand though that it's more than Excel macros. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. But yeah. but it, it, and I think a lot of the companies that I see out there are trying to sell Excel macros as. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you got to say that you're doing AI something, right? The generative AI these days. But uh, anyways, no, that's that's great perspective. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, so let's uh, let's get on to um, uh, the topic I'd like to close with, because you and I both wrote um, piece or contributed to pieces, uh, you and Telcom TV. Um, I, I contributed some thoughts uh, to uh, fierce wireless, uh, wireless about the departure of Tarek Amin. So, I mean, um, you wrote some great stuff and uh, I mean, uh, why don't you take a moment to share some of your key thoughts? I mean, you wrote quite a bit and I agree with a lot of the things that you uh, you contributed into um, uh, that piece. Um, so, yeah, what what was your reaction? Uh, what was my reaction? I. I... I wasn't too surprised. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, Tarek has done a great service to the telecoms industry. Mm -hmm. He's pushed boundaries. Uh, he's proven uh, that it was possible to do things that nobody else believed uh, could be yeah. done. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and while doing that, he was able to do that not as a science project, but you know, at an operational scale level yeah. in in a network. Um, mm. So that that that's a fantastic uh, achievement. Mm. Um, and because he was, he is a great technologist uh, and a great marketer and a great salesperson. Yeah. Uh, it was a little bit the Tarek show, <laughs> uh, yeah. you know, and. Uh, and that has pros and cons, right? But yeah. I mean, you when you're growing a company, um, you have you need different skill set for different stages of growth of the company. Yeah. Um, and and some founders and executive can uh, or want to uh, go through all those stages, and others don't, and that's okay. It's fine. No. Um, I, I think um, yeah, no, I think he's done great services for this industry. I think we'll see him uh again uh do other disruptive things yeah. um and i but i think that rakuten mobile and rakuten symphony will be fine and will be actually able to take this opportunity to you know uh regroup and uh and adapt their strategy yeah i personally you know felt that uh Archer star for instance uh mm -hmm. would have been better off and open run movement generally Speaking would have been better off if it hadn't been acquired by Rakuten Mobile because uh -huh. I, I think yeah. I think uh, it was the market leader at that time. Yeah, um, and I think we would have seen earlier deployments, commercial deployments at scale uh, mm -hmm. in other countries in Western Europe uh, mm -hmm. if we hadn't seen that 
that disrupted the market. Mm. Um, mm. So, you know, there's there's a mixed bag here. Uh, I, I, yeah. I, but I think as far as, you know, he he was doing what was necessary for the companies that he was yeah. uh, heading and uh, yeah. he was doing the right thing from that perspective. Yeah, um, I, I wish we uh, we had he had more time uh, and, and that he didn't leave so soon. Because, like you said, I think he had a tremendous impact. I mean, I, I don't think Open RAN would be where it is today without him in many ways, because he has the biggest proof point that it can work at scale, which is the Rakuten network. And um, man, you have to have guts to do what he did. I remember seeing him up on stage for the first time. I think it was like MWC 2018, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. 2018 and he was up on stage and uh you know i i was attending the unveiling of rock 10 mobile and um wow at that time no one thought that he they thought this is just a this is fantasy yeah. right and in two years less than two years he rolls out a network and that's pretty that's pretty impressive that's a that's an accomplishment i just hope that the industry never forgets the contribution that he made, whether you, you know, yes, he was an edgy guy, you know, always nice, at least to me, I, I but to accomplish something like that, you got to have a bit of edge to yourself, you know, you're going to have rough, you're going to, you're going to have a rough edge, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, he's uh, because, an executive, he was taking decisions, right? And, uh, yeah, and that's it, what it, he was it, really good at, and not all decisions are popular or have to be, it's okay. Right, right. And, but not only that, even with the, many of the technology partners that he was working with and he was pushing them to the limit, you know, yeah, like it, the it technology was, wasn't even It was there. ruthless. He, he had, yeah. he had a mission, yeah. he had a mission and it was a battlefield. Yeah. Yeah. And for that, for the moment, the, for, for the moment that he was there, he, he did a lot of things that I don't think the industry, the community would have done for it itself. So, mm -hmm. um, but anyways, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to what he has uh, coming up next in his, uh, on his journey, his uh, exciting journey. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously we wish him, wish him well and all the best, but um, Patrick, you know what? Thank you so much for spending time with me. It, it was really fun really great no it's great it's been a blast thanks a lot Leonard. we thanks gotta do it again <laughs> and uh, you know feel free anytime you publish anything that you think hey you know those guys at next curve might find this interesting uh, invite yourself on i'd love to have you on again uh and uh, i'd also love to uh get my audience cognizant of the work that you're doing and the wonderful insights that you bring to the industry so thank you so much Thank you so no, much. Thank you. Thank you. You're doing a great yeah. service to the industry yourself. Uh, oh, I'm yeah. following you uh, and your reports. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, you're doing a tremendous job. So thanks a lot. Well, and, uh, coming from and thanks you, for that, uh, having me. Yeah, I, I, you know, no problem. Not at all. And it's been a complete pre pleasure. So, uh, you know, uh, why don't you do this? Take a moment to inform our audience how they can uh, connect with you and connect with all the great um, research that you're doing on an ongoing basis. Ongoing basis, folks. Yeah. This guy's Thank always you. pumping out stuff and on webcasts on every single channel you can imagine. And uh, so take this moment. Thanks, Leonard. Um, well, um, easy to find. Uh, there's my website, uh, coreanalysis.ca. Uh, you'll find there uh, my contacts. You'll have uh, you'll find my blog. I publish a lot on LinkedIn, so don't hesitate to reach out. It's Patrick uh, Lopez, uh, uh, and um, um, I'm just releasing uh, the report that I was announcing a few weeks ago uh, around Rick uh, and apps. Uh, so it's being released as we speak in the in the coming weeks. So. Uh, you can reach out to me and uh, and we can discuss. And I do also a variety of workshops and uh, um, help companies uh, with their strategy when it comes to yeah. uh, you know uh, technology strategy, uh, market strategy, uh, corporate strategy. So uh, don't hesitate to reach out and get in touch. Yeah, he's the man doing workshops. I mean that that sounds like a great deal right there. You know that that sounds like essential stuff. You know. 
Uh, but Patrick, thank you so much. And thanks for everyone. Uh, thanks to everyone, excuse me, for tuning in. And uh, please subscribe to the Next Curve YouTube channel. Uh, the easiest thing to do to subscribe is go to our research portal at www.next-curve.com. And, uh, you know, it's a great one stop shop for all Next Curve research content and media. And you'll be notified when we publish new articles and content such as this really awesome interview with Patrick Lopez of Core Analysis. And, uh, you know, until next time, take care, keep it real. And once again, Patrick, thank you so much. No, thank you so much, Leonard. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in.